Turn to Exodus 15. Uh, we left off. We got through most of Exodus 15 last week, looking at the greatest celebration, worship service, probably of all time. It's when we saw the Israelites, they were pinned down at the Nueva, Nueva Beach. You have that video? Go ahead and put that up there. That's not it. Wow, that looks like Grand Junction. There it is. Okay. Is that the video? Huh? Okay, go ahead and move it. So that's the beach called Nueva Beach. You see the yellow lines, squiggly line to the now bottom. That's called the uh, Wadi Watir. It's, uh, the Wadi is a canyon 18 miles long. And that's the only beach in that area that would fit two and a half to three million people. It's huge. And so they can't go north. They can't go south. They're backed up against this uh, Red Sea. Pharaoh has sent his armies after them. Is it still moving or is it done? Okay, it's done. Okay. Uh, so they'll cross the Red Sea there. It's called the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. It's the top um, finger on the right side of your Bibles. If you look, at it, your Bible won't have that crossing there. They put it at the Sea of Reeds, which is really ridiculous. 12 inches of water drowned Pharaoh's army. But be that as it may, we saw that. Uh, they cross the Red Sea, they get over to the other side, and then they begin to, you know, just standing there, just stunned. I mean, they, what can you say? God parts the waters, they walk on dry land. Um, as they cross over, they get to the other side, and then it tells us in chapter 14, uh, verse 24, that during the morning watch, that's when the Egyptians come rushing down. Josephus says it was about 250,000 Egyptians that come rushing down. It's 10 miles across there. And then at sunrise, in chapter 14, verse 27, when the morning appeared, or sunrise, that's when God brought the waters down upon all the Egyptians and drowned them in the depths, it says, of the Red Sea. And as the Israelites are, again, standing there just in utter amazement, chapter 15 deals with the song of Moses. He begins to sing that song, I will sing unto the Lord. He is triumphed gloriously, the horse and the riders thrown into the sea. And everybody begins to join in. And pretty soon you've got two and a half to three million Israelites worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord for giving them victory over their enemies. And, and it just spreads throughout the whole crowd. It says at the end uh, that we saw last week, chapter uh, 15, 20, and 21, Miriam grabs a tambourine, this timbrel, and she starts singing and dancing. Then all the women join, and they're singing and dancing. And so this happened in the morning. I'm sure it went all day long, probably into the night. And, you know, they were just so emotionally high at this point because after 400 years of brutal slavery in Egypt, they're now officially set free, and that heavy weight of bondage has been lifted off of their shoulders by their... Lord and Savior. Now, I don't know, when you got saved, when I got saved, I had a radical conversion. I mean, I was, you know, heathen dog pig, whatever you want to call me. And um, that night, it was a Wednesday night, November 30th, 1977, Pastor Mike McIntosh, Calvary Chapel, San Diego, preached a simple, clear gospel message. And then he gave an invitation, whoever was serious about receiving Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, come on down. And then I jumped out of my seat. I felt like I was three feet off the ground because literally all the weight of sin came, you know, lifted off of me. It was just amazing. God's love and forgiveness was overpowering. And even though I had no concept of things like regeneration and, you know, justification and sanctification and atonement or adoption, all those things happened to me at that moment. I couldn't describe any of it, but it was just that moment when God just did a whole new work. And I knew I was not the same person I used to be. I was clean. I was forgiven. All my sins were washed away, and I was saved forever by Jesus Christ the Lord. And again, I can still remember the joy, the peace, and God's love that just flooded into my soul, into my heart that night. And so in some small way, I think I can identify with this awesome experience of the Jewish people here at that moment, coming out of bondage, you know, leaving Egypt behind, going to a whole new place, a whole new direction in life with the Lord. And so some people refer to that new beginning that we have with the Lord as a honeymoon phase. 
And there's a lot of truth in that because, you know, when you on a honeymoon, everything's new, everything's fresh, everything's exciting and innocent. But obviously after the honeymoon phase, you know, reality sets in, there's going to be challenges, there's difficult times that each one of us will face head on. And we'll see this this morning with the Israelites in a moment, because when you think, just when you think everything's great, everything's wonderful, life couldn't be better, something happens. Something difficult all of a sudden appears out of nowhere. Uh, the unexpected might show up at your front door. Most all of us have faced these unforeseen circumstances in life. But when it comes to these things, it, it, it puts our faith to the test. And that's what we'll see with God. He puts our faith to the test. And I've always appreciated John Corson's simple yet profound perspective on this, where he says, whatever the Lord brings into your life, it will either cause you to become better or bitter. Whatever comes into your life, it'll either make you better or bitter. That's so true. We'll see this very clearly as we follow the Israelites on their journey through the wilderness. Yes, there are joyful times, but yes, there will be difficult times. In our own journey through this wilderness of life, we too have times that are wonderful, but there will also be times of trials and struggles. In all of our journeys through life, there are valuable lessons that we need to learn and here in Exodus, the Israelites have some very important lessons that they must learn, that God will teach them, that they will grow through, that God will bring them through. But this is God's way of teaching them to become dependent on the Lord. He wants all of us dependent on Jesus, not on anybody else, not on our governments, but dependent first and foremost on the Lord. He wants us to realize that only He can provide, only He can supply all that we need for life and godliness. And not only is God meeting our needs for today, but He will also meet all of our needs that will take us into eternity, into glory with Christ. So whatever you're going through in this life, look to the Lord. He does have a plan. He does have a purpose no matter what you face today. I mean, that's why we quote verses like Romans 8:28 that says, and we know that all things, not some things, but all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And in speaking about all these things the Israelites went through in the wilderness, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition, our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Romans 15, 4, Paul also says, For whatever things were written before, like we're looking at in Exodus, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So the Holy Spirit will use these Scriptures to strengthen us, to encourage us, to give us that hope in what God is doing. And so, you and I are on a similar journey to the Israelites here. God will use all of your situations, all of your circumstances to help mold you and shape you into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. So look at chapter 15. We're going to pick up in verse 22. Let's just read to the end of this chapter real quickly. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, speaking of the ten plagues. For I am the Lord who heals you, Jehovah Rapha. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water 
and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. So right after this great celebration, everybody's worshiping and praising the Lord, they set out on this three-day journey into the wilderness. Again, they're in the land of Midian, present-day Saudi Arabia, a very desolate land. Now remember, it's the Lord, not Moses, it's the Lord who's leading them. They were only following the pillar of fire by day or night and the pillar of cloud by day. And so the Lord leads them to this place where there is no water. Are you making a mistake, God? Why'd you bring us out here to this Lord forsaken, God forsaken place? I mean, a lot of people have that attitude about life. It's dry out here. It's thirsty. I remember when we were looking at moving to Grand Junction, 1985, we moved. 1984, Elizabeth said, don't ever move me to that God-forsaken place. It's so barren. Because every time we came out, it was like in May or March or April. Nothing was green. Everything was brown. It was just like, ugh. And then we finally went up in the Mesa, and it was like, ah. This is nice. This is beautiful up here. So anyway, there are, three, there, there are three things to remember as you go through God's school of life. Number one is God doesn't always explain the details in advance. He doesn't always let us know what is going to happen in the future. Many times we'll start to figure things out as God is do, you know, what God is doing in the route that we're taking, but it's kind of a, you know, need to know basis. God wants us to just depend on him, trust him as he leads us and guides us. I find that the better I know Jesus, the easier it becomes to walk by faith and not by sight as we enter these difficult areas of life. So that's the first thing. God doesn't always explain the details. Number two is no genuine Christian will ever fail the course that God has for them. You won't fail the test. You might have to retake the test a few times, but eventually we will all pass the test. Philippians 1.6, And being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. He'll eventually complete the work he's doing in your life. Eventually we will all pass the test. Number three is, our schooling doesn't end in this life. In other words, none of us will graduate from the university of God until we die. We are perpetual students. Now, some of our friends that go to school perpetually, uh, it's kind of a weird thing to me. I hated school. Now, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to get out of there. I just wanted to play baseball and surf. I didn't want to study. You know, I majored in basket weaving. But none of us graduate from the university of God till we die, till we take our last breath on earth. That means as long as we're in this world, living in these bodies, we will always be learning and hopefully growing in our relationship with Christ. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God. If you're born again, you're a child of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And so it's not until the rapture, when we're out of these bodies of mortality into our you know, resurrection bodies of immortality, this corruption must put on incorruption, then we will be graduated from God's university. But anyway, as the cloud starts to move, all the Israelites start moving. They start following the cloud. And I can imagine, you know, they're all excited. They had a great night's sleep, just rejoicing in the Lord. That first day they set off, and I'm sure they're still singing and humming that song. You know, we will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumph gloriously. The horse and rider cast into the sea. By day two, they're starting to run out of water a little bit. And they're probably slowing down. Like, okay, we'll sing to the Lord. He's triumph gloriously. By day three, they're like, oh, my gosh, we're going to die out here. There's no water anywhere. All our water's gone. They're just creeping along. And they're probably thinking, well, you know, Moses seems to be knowing where he's going, but obviously he doesn't. And, and so day three, you got the kids, Mom, Dad, are we there yet? Mom, Dad, I go to the bathroom. Mom, Dad, I'm thirsty. The cattle are probably slowing down. Remember, they got a lot of cattle with them. And so it's getting to be desperation time. 
And so Moses has about two and a half million unhappy campers at this moment. Look at verse 23. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. Marah means bitter. So can you picture this? Three days without water, all of a sudden somebody sees this big, large, maybe it's a lake, big, large pool of water out there in the middle of nowhere, and people see something on the horizon. Wow, there's water, and everybody starts running towards it. People are probably diving in, jumping in. People are probably lapping it up, and all of a sudden they're gagging and spitting it out as fast as they've got it in their mouth. It's bitter. It's nasty. They can't drink it. Now, when I think of bitter water like this, I always think, of the Dead Sea. Some of you that have been to the Dead Sea with us, you know, the Dead Sea is awesome. You can float, you can bob, you know, you can just walk out and you don't sink. You can't sink. You'll, you'll be right up to your waist and you're just standing there and you're floating. You're just bobbing. Good time to be named Bob. So you're just bobbing around. And so, but you don't want it in your mouth. It's so bitter. And if it gets in your eyes, it will burn like crazy. You know, a few times ago when I was there, I got water splashed in my eye, and I couldn't see, and somebody had to lead me out. There's showers right there, and I'm just like, ah, trying to get it out. It's nasty, and that's a plug for March of 25. <laughs> We're going back to, not to the bitter waters. We're going back to Israel and a side trip to Jordan, if anybody's interested. Anyway, you don't want this bitter water in your system, and so these Israelites, to them, this is like the worst-case scenario. We got water, but we can't drink it. I mean, we're going to die out here. Now, they all have a choice to make. They could all, A, call out to the Lord. Oh, Father, we need your help. Lord, you have done so many miraculous things already. You, you got us out of Egypt with the ten plagues. We saw the Passover. We celebrated that, Lord. You took us through the Red Sea. You destroyed our enemies. Lord, we know we can't drink this water, so we call out to you. That's A. B is grumble and complain against Moses. It's your fault. You brought us out to this place. You know, why did you bring us to this stinking place? We're upset with you. So that was their choice. Obviously, they picked wrong, but that's so much like our human nature. When things aren't going the way we want or think they should go, it's very easy to start blaming others for the predicament we find ourselves in. Now look at verse 24. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now don't think they're politely asking, Oh, Mr. Moses, what shall we drink? I mean, they're not asking in a nice way. The word complain here refers to someone who is angry and bitter. And their attitude is, this is your fault, Moses. You did this. What are we going to drink? You know, this water's bitter, and so are we. Now, in reality, they're not complaining against Moses. Who are they really complaining against? They're complaining against God. Moses is just following the cloud. He's just going where the pillar takes them. He's just following the Lord's leading. It was the Lord who brought them to the bitter waters of Marah. By way of application, let me just say that eventually every believer will find themselves at the bitter waters of Mara. There's no escaping it. It's part of God's plan, and it's part of our journey to visit bitter places. Most of us in here, you've been at the bitter waters of Mara already. Some of you know what you're, I'm talking about here. It may have been a health issue. It may have been a bitter marriage or even a more bitter divorce. Maybe it was a prodigal son. Maybe it was a loved one that passed away, and it was just a brutal time. That's the bitter waters of Mara. But any time we come to a place like Mara, when we're faced with bitter and difficult situations in life, we have the same choices as these Israelites. Do we grumble? Do we complain against whoever? Do we just blast people around us, or do we take it to the Lord and say, Father, I don't know what's going on, but I praise you that you know what's going on. You love me. You care for me. You're sovereign. You're in control. You're on the throne of my life, Lord. So I commit my heart to you, and Lord, help me, because I don't want to, you know, this situation to make me bitter. I want this situation to make me better. 
Now, again, Mara can also picture disappointment. These people were thirsty. They're expecting refreshment. They're expecting, you know, satisfaction. But when they get there, they're really let down. They're extremely disappointed. And, and you know, there's a lot of things like Mara in this world that can leave you very disappointed, very discouraged. You know, it might be fill in the blank. Oh, if I only had this toy, then I'll be happy. Or if I only could go to this place, then I'll be happy. And when you get that new toy or you go to that new place, you're still really disappointed. If only I was married to that person, I'd be happy. If only I wasn't married to this person, then I'd be happy. If only I could get that job or live in that house or buy that car. But again, this is why it's so important to seek first the Lord on all these things. The very first verse I ever memorized as a baby Christian was Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added unto you. But you got to seek the Lord first and then let him take care of all the things, the other things he wants to do in your life. Here's another important thing to take note of here. These Israelites, they are not in Mara because of some sin. They're not in this difficult place because they have sinned. They weren't in this situation because of their lack of faith. They were here because they followed the Lord. God is not mad at them. He's not punishing them. It's just part of the journey God has them on. You remember when the disciples, you know, they were with Jesus, and he sees that man who was born blind, and their question was, why is this guy born blind? Because of his sin? Well, you know, he was born blind. It wasn't his sin. Or his parents, was it their sin? Is that why he's born blind? And Jesus said, neither. But that the glory of God would be revealed, and then Jesus heals the man. So sometimes you're just in a bad place just because you're in a bad place and it's not your fault. And it's not always because you sinned. Again, God uses hard times to teach us, to train us, to become more dependent on Jesus. That's the whole point. Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation. And he's talking about trials and struggles that come from the world, from our own flesh, from Satan. But he says, be of good cheer or take courage. I have overcome the world. This is just the opposite of many of the false teachers in our day who will tell their followers, if you're sick, it's because of your lack of faith. If you're poor, it's be your lack of faith. If you're, you know, Poor, it's because you're not tithing to our ministry. That's a lot of them will say. You're a king's kid, they'll tell you. He always wants his kids healthy and wealthy. That's a bunch of baloney. That, that's not true at all. Many of the greatest men and women of faith we read about in the Bible and even through history were persecuted. They were destitute. They were physically and emotionally weak. They were commended in the scriptures because of their great faith in the Lord and in his word. Check this out, Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16. We read of those whose faith was strong in the Lord, not in themselves, but in the Lord. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They were not looking for their best life now. They were looking for the Lord and what he had for their lives. And so when you read the Hebrews Hall of Faith, a lot of people refer to that in Hebrews chapter 11, God's word not only speaks of those saints who by faith the Lord used and they experienced great exploits for the kingdom of God, but then as you get to the end of chapter 11, he talks about these men and women of great faith who had a brutal, who were really messed over. They would go through beatings and tortures and other things. You'll never hear these quoted by the false teachers out there. Look at Hebrews 11, starting in verse 36. Again, these are in the Hebrews Hall of Faith. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. 
Now, that had a whole different connotation back then than it does in Colorado today. They didn't have dispensaries. He's not talking about that. They were stoned with rocks thrown at their heads. Some of you maybe had too many years of that. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. We don't know exactly who that was. History says uh, the wicked king Manasseh of Judah had Isaiah the prophet sawn in two. That could be the reference there. And these are mighty men of faith. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. And that was not a fashion statement at the time. Being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so they went through horrendous trials and sufferings, but their eyes were on the Lord, and he was going to reward them. They were looking for the foundation, the city of God whose foundation is from the Lord. He's the builder, he's the maker, he's the creator. So by faith, they endured tough times. Now look at verse 25. So he, speaking of Moses, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. So again, we see this over and over when you look at you know, Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, especially in Deuteronomy, it says the Lord was testing them. He put them through major tests. Much of what we go through in this life, it's a test from the Lord. The various things we go through often are situations that instruct us, uh, they teach us, they will show us what changes we need to make in our own hearts, in our own lives. He's not punishing us and beating us up, but he's wanting to show us, this is my plan for you. I want your life to be in line with me and my word. In Deuteronomy 8, the Israelites are about to enter the promised land after 40 years wandering in the desert. And Moses reminds the people why God took them through so many difficult situations. Yeah, but Deuteronomy 8, starting in verse 2, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, notice, to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart. We don't even know what's in our own hearts. We need the Lord to reveal these things to us, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna. Lord willing, we'll see that next week in chapter 16. That's where the manna is first brought on the scene. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, the man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Who else quoted that? Jesus. Yeah, when he's being tempted by Satan. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your feet swell those 40 years. That's pretty amazing. There's another verse that says that their sandals didn't wear out. Man, I'd love to have the patent on those tevas. 40 years, it did not wear out. Well, I guess that wouldn't be good because if they didn't wear out, nobody ever buy more pair. So anyway, squirrel. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. You know, it tells us in Hebrews 12 that whom the Lord loves, he chastens or disciplines because he loves us. We're his kids. You know, if your little child, two or three years old, wants to run out and play in the freeway, you would do whatever you could to chasten your son, your daughter, to not do that. It's wrong. It's going to hurt you. So obviously God does that with us because we can be little brats sometimes. And so you could rightly say that Mara was a maturity test. And over the next 40 years, God was going to keep testing them. But the good thing about God's testing system is that when we fail a test, again, you will have to retake it. And God will have you retake it. And I get tired of retaking those tests. But again, for us, it's an open book test. 
All the answers are here in the word, right? We have no excuse. It's a pass, pass test. Often we read in the Bible, and it came to pass. In other words, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. In Psalm 23, we see that our Lord, our shepherd, Jesus, he not only leads us to the green pastures and the nice, still, calm waters, but he also is with us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Psalm 139, verse 23, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties or anxious thoughts. And see if there's a wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, it's important for us to ask the Lord to show us what's really going on in our hearts, because we can deceive ourselves so easily. Like Jeremiah, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, the Lord knows it. Philippians 4.12, the Apostle Paul says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. So I know how to be with nothing, and I know how to abound when I'm doing well. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And here's a verse we all know, but this is the context of it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, I can get through life victoriously even when I'm poor. Even when I don't have a roof over my head, God will watch over me. He is faithful. He loves me. I'm his child. Even if you're a prodigal and you've wandered off and now you find yourselves in the pig pen wrestling carob pods from the pigs, humble yourself, come back to the Lord, and he is still your father who still loves you, and he will throw his robe around you because he loves you. When you look at these verses and you see how they rejoiced at the Red Sea, it's important to be able to rejoice at Mara as well. It's one thing to praise the Lord when everything's going great, but can you praise the Lord when everything is difficult? As we grow and mature in the Lord, then we begin to realize that life is going to be a mixture of bitter and sweet. And oftentimes, as we see here in verse 25, what starts off as bitter, as a brutal situation, often becomes one of the sweetest places you'll ever experience. And did you notice what made the waters sweet? A tree. Now, that's a miracle. You know, some liberal theologians try to explain, well, you know, they cut the tree and the sap in the tree, turn the water, and it's like, come on. Two and a half million people aren't drinking out of a little cup where some sap from a tree did something to it. I mean, this is a big pond. One tree is not going to do that, but this is a miracle. When Moses casts this tree into this water, it becomes sweet. In other words, it becomes clean, it's refreshing, and the people could drink it up. They were satisfied. It's just a miracle. And that's exactly what God has done for all of us who know that our lives are full of mara, full of bitterness, full of animosity, full of anger filled with dirty sins. Spiritually, our lives were like Mara, poisoned. But God has thrown a tree into our world of sin, and he has made our bitter lives sweet. What is the tree? The cross. The cross of Christ. God saw this sinful world. He put Jesus on the cross. And the cross can instantly change your outlook, can instantly change your life. 1 Peter 2.24 says of Jesus, who, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So Jesus took upon himself all the wrath, the judgment that I deserve for my sins. He took it upon himself. Galatians 3.13, Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You're trying to make yourself holy and righteous by keeping the Ten Commandments. You will fail because you cannot keep God's perfect standard. But Jesus became a curse for us. Notice, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. By his death on the cross, Jesus has made our lives 
that were bitter, that were sinful. He's turned them into lives that are now sweet, refreshing, new creations in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And through the blood that he shed on the cross, Jesus has washed us. He has cleansed us. He has forgiven us. He has purified our lives. John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And we'll talk more about that next time in chapter 16, the manna. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And in other words, only Jesus can satisfy a thirsty soul. Every other source of water you drink from to try to make yourself spiritually whole, it'll leave you bitter. Because nothing in this world will satisfy but Jesus Christ. You'll still be bitter. You'll still be discouraged. You'll still be empty. But when you come to Jesus, he will fill you up. When I look back on my life and I think of those bitter experiences that I went through, I realize this is all part of the journey. You know, God was gracious and he is still gracious and he still brings us through those difficult times. And so whenever you're going through a difficult, hard time or season in your life, it's a bitter time. Make sure you bring the cross of Christ into the midst of it. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, Paul says it's the power of God. We bring the cross into the midst of it. We cast all of our cares upon Jesus. We know he cares for us. We die on the cross daily because we know that I don't want to puff up my flesh. I want to deny myself. I want to get rid of this flesh. I want Jesus to work in me and through me because it's at the cross where God demonstrated his unconditional love for you and for me. That's where Jesus paid the price in full to redeem us. Notice also here in verse 25 that it was here at Mara that God made a statute and an ordinance for them. A statute is a law. It's a settled truth that they were to believe. An ordinance was a principle to live by in light of the truth of God's word. Here's the statute. Here's the ordinance. Verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Again, Jehovah Rapha. This is an amazing promise to the Israelites here. If you'll heed my voice, heed my words, keep my commandments, I will protect you from all the diseases I put upon the Egyptians. I am Jehovah Rapha. And it says, the Lord who heals you. That word heals is in the present tense. The only reason you're still alive today is because the Lord is healing your body. He's keeping you going. I mean, it's a medical miracle that any of us are still alive. You know, after Elizabeth had her uh, head injury two months ago, I mean, you realize how fragile we are. I mean, we could be taken out in a blink of an eye, but God is so gracious. This powerful principle is still here, and, and it's still true today. We can avoid so many hardships if we would simply live by and obey God's word. And we can only do that if we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. God didn't say, here, do it. But he gives us his word, and he gives us his Holy Spirit who enables us to live out what he's called us to do. Galatians 6. Look at these verses, starting in verse 7. This is for all of us as believers. Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so God wants us to keep hanging in there with the Lord. You know, he wants us to keep walking with him. He'll get us through whatever trials and struggles we face. Look at verse 27. We'll wrap it up here. It says, Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Mara equals bitterness. What does Elam represent? Oasis, refreshing, refreshment, peace, rest. You get that picture? 
This is present day Elam. Uh, this is Saudi Arabia. For miles and miles and miles, there's nothing around there but dirt, desert. There's still 12 wells there in Elam. It's amazing. It wasn't even discovered for like 100 years ago because it was so desolate. And it's an amazing place. But once we've learned our lessons and have passed the test at Mara, God will always bring us to Elam. Now, this is often what we experience throughout the years. Hard times followed by good times. Times of pain and suffering and times of health and happiness. Now, for some people who love Jesus, their entire life on earth may be a Mara experience. I think of those who, you know, had born with some disability or those who were in an accident. I mean, think of Johnny Erickson Tata, 17-year-old healthy girl, dives into a pool, breaks her neck. She's a quadriplegic. She wanted to die, but how many years has it been? Like 50-plus years. God has just kept her going, and God has used her in tremendous ways. She's in a Mara experience. She has pain daily. And yet, her Elam, when is she going to reach Elam? When she passes away and goes to be with the Lord. For some people, that's where our Elam will be. You might struggle, you might be downcast, you might be discouraged today, but ultimately we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord in heaven. We'll see Jesus face to face. You know, you remember Todd, he was in a wheelchair here, he went home to be with the Lord maybe 10 years ago now. Ed Harris just recently went home to be with the Lord. Those guys were in a almost a perpetual state of being in Mara, bitterness, but their hearts weren't bitter. They loved Jesus. And so they are now in the presence of the Lord. That's Elam, when you die and go home to be with Jesus. We can experience the Elams in this life, the good times as well, but Praise the Lord. When we stand in the presence of the Lord and see him face to face, that will be the sweetest moment of all. Let me wrap it up with these verses in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, starting in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Remember Jesus tabernacled among us? came flesh and he will dwell with them and this is speaking of heaven and they shall be his people god himself will be with them and be their god and god will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away again this is the ultimate elam you might say then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So if you're a Mara, bitter waters, a day is coming when you'll be drinking freely from the fountain of living water in the presence of the Lord. But that living water is available right now through the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen.